Hello everyone and welcome to our online webinar. In recent years the Caucasus has grown to become one of our most popular regions and tonight you'll find out why as Wild Frontiers founder Johnny Bealby and Director of Operations Mark Liederman share some of the delights of Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan. The talk will last around an hour after which we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So if, if, if at any point something pops into your head that you'd like to know, you'll see there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you use that, click on that, you'll be able to type a question and submit it to us. We'll go through some of those time permitting at the end. We'll be sending an email tomorrow with a link to view this talk online so you can share it with friends or even watch it again if you're super keen. So look out for that. But without further ado, let me hand over to Johnny now, who's going to introduce the Caucasus. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, good morning, wherever you happen to be, and very warm welcome to all of you um, from uh, us here at Wild Frontiers. This is our fourth webinar, and uh, I'm delighted to be talking about such a fascinating region as, uh, of the Caucasus, with a history dating back into the midst of time, uh, a region at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, fought over by so many, so many times, and yet strangely overlooked, often overlooked. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a place that is um, incredibly wonderful for the modern traveler in terms of history, culture, and uh, landscapes, it makes it basically unmissable. And for me personally, I am delighted to be uh, talking about uh, Georgia particularly today because it's one of my favorite countries. I've been traveling there since uh, the late 90s um, and I, I've always found it an in incredibly deep, rich, soulful country. And particularly when you think that when I first started traveling there, uh, it was a pretty much a catastrophic mess of a country in the late 90s, but it's become over the uh, recent years much more prosperous and proud. So, so that's great. So um, what the format of tonight is, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of my background in the region. Then um, I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk about Azerbaijan. He's going to hand over to me. I'm going to talk about Georgia. And then Mark will talk about Armenia. So we're going to do an east-west journey from the, uh, Arme uh, Azerbaijan through to Armenia, so from Baku to Yerevan. And, and the reason for that is that that is the uh, routing of our kind of signature trip to the region, which is called Across the Caucasus. So we are going to follow a kind of group tour routing, but please, again, uh, I always say this in these webinars, do bear in mind that we offer a full tailor-made service. So we have travel consultants that have traveled extensively in this region, and they will be able to put together a private trip for you if one of the group tours that we have doesn't suit you. Um, right, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we will kick off. So, back in the 90s, as many of you will know if you've been watching these webinars recently, I did three big adventures. I rode a motorbike right the way around Africa, I walked through parts of India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan into the Hindu Kush region and I rode a horse along the Silk Road from Kashgar to the Caspian Sea. Uh, this culminated in three travel books, Running with the Moon about the motorcycle journey, for a pagan song about the walk through Afghanistan, and Silk Dreams Troubled Road about the journey by horse along the Silk Road. And really it's this last book that is most pertinent to this particular talk tonight because it was from this journey that I ended up traveling into the Caucasus. Um, this is me in about December 1999, just before the millennium. Um, I kind of, we ditched our horses at the Caspian Sea and we, or I, I should say, uh, jumped on that ferry there called the Dagestan and uh, kind of headed across the Caspian. Now, it was a funny old evening because I had uh, gone down to the local bazaar in Turkmenbashi and bought half a kg of caviar, as you do, uh, for $20. I have to say at the time I had no idea what kind of bargain I was getting until I ended up in Frankfurt Airport and saw that it was $150 per 100 grams. So um, anyway, I bought this caviar, I bought a little bottle of vodka, I got my way onto the ferry and I went up to the bursar and said, here's $10, can I have a berth, which was what you did in those days. He said, yeah, fine. I asked what time we were going to be leaving. He said, shortly. 
I went to my room, had some vodka, drank, drank, drank some vodka, had a bit of caviar, went to sleep expecting to wake up in Baku, woke up in Turkmenbashi. I was there for another 24 hours. Those ferries are not very reliable. But eventually, I got across to Baku, and what a beautiful city that was. Mark, I won't steal Mark's thunder, he'll talk you through that. Um, but from there, I, I took the midnight train to Georgia um, and traveled on up into this country. And I have to say, what I found was a bit of a mess. It was December, the snow was falling, we were still in a very, the country was still in a very dodgy state. Um, there was nowhere to stay. Uh, the only hotel was the Sheraton, uh, which was out of my price range. So I ended up here on the right hand side in what was an Abkhazian refugee center. This period of the 90s for a lot of the former Soviet countries was of course a very big transitional time from being part of the Soviet family into being independent and they were struggling to cope with it. They'd had breakaway problems in, in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia, which were predominantly Russian uh, uh, places. Um, and there were refugees in the center of the town. In fact, I saw two dead bodies lying on the street. It, it was a pretty grim place. There was no electricity. Uh, at this, ho it wasn't a hotel, sorry, at the Abkhazian Refugee Center. In fact, if you count four floors up and you see the blue tarpaulin, that was my room. No running water, I had to use my torch and get some water from a standpipe down below. However, I met some people in an Irish pub, <laughs> as you do, there's always an Irish pub, and we got chatting and they were just charming and they took me back to their mother's house and they gave me a big dinner and they explained to me something about Georgia. And from that moment on, I was a convert. Uh, and I promised that whenever I were to go, if I was to get Wild Frontiers off the ground, uh, Georgia would be one of my first destinations. And Georgia, over this period of this 20 years, has, has changed dramatically. Of course, in 2003, there was the all-important Rose Revolution, where the incumbent, um, Edward Shevardnadze, was deposed in favor of the 37-year-old uh, Columbia Law School educated Mikhail Saakashvili. Um, you all remember Shevardnadze, I'm sure, from the, being uh, Gorbachev's foreign minister under perestroika. Um, a lot of corruption uh, and he, uh, Saakashvili was welcomed in with open arms. Um, and so Georgia started to kind of boom. It started to look to the West. It was very, very keen on making good arrangements with America. It's one of the few places actually in kind of uh, this part of the world where you'll find um, a, a, a George Bush Jr. Ulitsa, a street named after George Bush. They, they loved America. They wanted to kind of look towards the West. Of course, that didn't please a certain Mr. Putin. And in 2008, the Russians invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Uh, Mark and I were in our office in London at the time. We had a group in the Svaneti region and we spent all weekend trying to uh, negotiate or maneuver, I should say, our group out of Svaneti, which was literally um, uh, kind of encircled by the Russian army to get them out across the border into Armenia and fly them out of Yerevan all in front of the Russian army. It was an extraordinary experience, not one that I expected to do when I set up Wild Frontiers. However, um, post that, uh, Georgia has boomed again. And, you know, the economy has got better. Um, and it's become, as I say, a very proud and prosperous nation, uh, relatively speaking. And so much so that they have gone in for some fairly fantastical uh, modern architecture. Um, in Tbilisi. I'll talk more about Tbilisi in a minute, but you can see this kind of, of, of architecture wanting, I think, to kind of maybe throw off the yoke of, the, of, of, of the, 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 the idea that it's just a place of ancient history. It's not. It's a modern, vibrant place. Um, I want to show you this photograph because this is um, the Radisson Blue Hotel, which was my Abkhazian refugee center. So that just shows you the changes that have happened in 20 years. Here you now have a beautiful infinity pool on, I think, the 18th floor looking out over the rest of Tbilisi. So the place has changed, but the soul of the people hasn't. And that is really what one goes to this region for. Um, I think it's what you carry away with you. Yes, it has extraordinary history. 
it has great cuisine, it has culture, it has everything, wonderful landscapes, it has everything that you would want from a travel destination. But as is so often the case, it's the people that make these places. And the Georgians are simply in a class of their own. There's nothing they like more than sharing a drink, sharing a chat and some good food with you and, uh, and, and reminiscing and making toasts and, and everything else. And it's, it's really, somebody once said to me, be careful, going to Georgia once will not be your last time. And so it's proved. I think I've been seven times since. Um, and the symbol there, which I like, is Mother Georgia standing guard over Tbilisi, the cup of wine to welcome you in the one hand, but should you mess with her, the sword to chop off your head. So there we are. That's my little history of my time in this part of the world. Um, I'm now going to stop sharing my screen so that Mark can pick up and talk about Azerbaijan. Okay, so good evening, good afternoon, good morning everyone. I'm actually going to start off talking about the Caucasus by sharing my screen and talking about weddings. Now, Everyone knows that a wedding should be a joyous occasion, both for the bride and groom and the guests. However, anyone that's ever organized a wedding know that this only ever happens if you get your seating plan right. And some families are quite complicated, where you might have a, an Auntie Doris who refuses to sit anywhere near to Uncle Pete because of that incident last summer at the barbecue. Well, if you can imagine, the Caucasus are a little bit like a dysfunctional family. Some of them don't particularly like sitting next to the other one. They will under certain conditions, but they won't be very happy about it. And so you've got to be a little bit careful as to how you navigate your way through the region. I'll try and explain. So if you look here, here's a, a more in-depth map of the region. Look at Azerbaijan over there on the right in red. Now, Azerbaijan, friends with Georgia, no problem. Happy to sit next to Georgia at the wedding. Armenia, not very happy about it. Azerbaijan and Armenia do not have a good relationship at all. But although they share a border, it's not an open border and you cannot cross between the two countries. But it's more complicated than that. If you look just down to the south of Armenia, you'll see an area also in red called Nakhchivan. Now that's part of Azerbaijan, but it's not physically connected with Azerbaijan. And you can only access it by flying there from Baku, on a domestic flight or over land from Iran. Adding to the complication, if you look at the area in green, Nagorno-Karabakh, that sits right between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's claimed by Azerbaijan, but it's only accessible via Armenia, even though it's not internationally recognized to be part of Armenia. Now let's move over to Georgia. Now Georgia's fine. Georgia's happy with Armenia, happy with Azerbaijan, happy to sit next to either of them. But as Johnny was mentioning earlier, those two breakaway regions you can see of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, although they're technically part of Georgia, you can't actually visit them from Georgia. If you want to visit them, you've got to cross the border into Russia, which isn't always open, and then access them via Russia. Finally, Armenia, as we've said, friends with Georgia, no problem, not friends with Azerbaijan, but adding to the complication, absolutely not friends with Turkey. Even though it shares quite a long border with Turkey, Armenia has no border with open border with Turkey, you can't cross. And this all dates back to um, claims of the Armenian genocide during the First World War. And this means, unfortunately, you can't cross from Armenia into Turkey and you can't use Turkish airways in order to fly there. So it's a little bit tricky to get around. Um, surprisingly, the only one that's kind of friendly with them all, in a way, your kind of Uncle Derek, who's happy to be sat next to anyone, is Iran. So there you go. Iran's the friendly Uncle Derek of the Caucasus region. <laughs> so as Johnny said, we have found a way to take you through the region. And this is our signature trip, the Across the Caucasus trip. Um, and as Johnny said, I'm going to talk to you about Azerbaijan, Johnny will talk about Georgia, and then I'll come back to tell you a little bit about Armenia. So starting in Azerbaijan, it's worth saying that it's probably the least well-known of the three Caucasus countries. 
It's the most Asian in feel. Um, and although in recent years, it's found a little bit of, I wouldn't say fame, potentially notoriety with the Eurovision, uh, with the Grand Prix, and probably not the best Bond film in the world, but if you want to watch it, The World Is Not Enough, um, Baku and Azerbaijan have um, gained, I think, kind of greater global renown. Um, but Azerbaijan's claim to fame doesn't rest on Ian Fleming. It's actually importance historically is huge. And if you just think about the location of Azerbaijan, it sits with Russia immediately to the north, and Iran immediately to the south. And at the end of the 19th century, with Azerbaijan sitting on the Caspian Sea, it's worth noting that 50% of the world's known oil reserves were in the Caspian Sea and came through Baku. And because of that, one of the most important battles of the First World War was fought specifically over those oil reserves. Now, it's not as well known as Gallipoli or as the Battle of the Somme, but this battle was crucial. And over 30,000 people died in this battle that pitted Ottomans and Bolsheviks against white Russians, Armenians, and British. And this war, and this battle, laid the foundations for part of the animosity that exists today between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, I cannot recommend highly enough another one of Johnny and mine's favorite author, Peter Hopkirk, who wrote the famous Great Game. Um, he wrote this book on Secret Service East of Constantinople, which talks all about this region, and it is a fascinating read. Anyway, moving on to what there is to see. Um, Baku itself, the capital of Azerbaijan, um, has got lots of great things to see. First of all, you've got the old city. Um, this is a World Heritage Site. Um, you've got fortified walls. You've got a 15th century um, palace. And you've got the iconic Maiden's Tower. Now, there's a great story behind this. They say that there was a, a local king who wanted to betroth his daughter to a, a prince for strategic purposes. Um, but the daughter wasn't very happy about it because she didn't love the guy. So she said to her dad, I'm not crazy about this, but I'll tell you what, I'll do it if you build me a big tower. So the dad was like, okay, I'll build you a big tower. She went, no, bigger, bigger, bigger. Eventually, 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 he built this big tower. She went, thanks very much, climbed to the top and jumped off and committed suicide in order to avoid marrying the prince. So that's a, a famous folkloric story, which you'll find in poems and in plays throughout um, Azerbaijan. And it is a kind of iconic symbol of the city. You've also got some of the old buildings that have been converted into some nice, if you notice, socially distanced restaurants. Um, you've also got some architecture dating back to the Ottoman times, and then some more recent architecture dating back to Russian influence times. And this is the, again, another iconic building. This is the Dom Soviet um, kind of government building, which you'll find in the newer part of Baku. Um, and similar to Tbilisi, Azerbaijan has also embraced the new, um, and you'll find some absolutely stunning examples of modern architecture there. This is actually a hotel. This is the Fairmont Hotel, the famous Flame Towers. And this is an architecturally awarded uh, building called the Haydar Aliyev Cultural Center. Um, so again, just from a, a modern and ancient point of view, lots to appreciate there. And on the outskirts of Baku, there are some of the weirdest sites I've ever seen. How about this for your kind of beach retreat? I don't think you'd get the same crowds that you'd get down um, on the south coast of England. Um, but how do you fancy taking a nice um, beach break with oil rigs in the distance? Um, just to the north of Baku, you've got a peninsula called the Absheron Peninsula. And this has been known in antiquity and used for Zoroastrianism, which used to be the dominant religion of the country when it was part of the Persian Empire. And fire is very, very important for the Zoroastrians. Um, and there are flames there which are said to have been burning continuously for thousands of years, which if you take into consideration the oil reserves um, are probably to be believed. And then if you drive just about an hour south of Baku, you've got another World Heritage Site. This place is called Kobustan, and this has got some absolutely wonderful petroglyphs, which date back 6,000 years. But on our journey, we're going to leave Baku and start heading uh, westwards, 
And as you drive along the interior, you'll have the Caucasus Mountains over on the right hand side. And we take a, a, a journey into the Caucasus Mountains to a little village called La Huge, which is beautiful. It's got some nice old streets and it's famed for its copperware. And we usually spend the night there on our trips. Then as you carry further and further into the country, you get to the crossroads town of Sheki. Now this has been an important town for many, many, many years. Um, and here you will find um, an 18th century caravanserai, which shows how trade was so important to the region. And you'll also find a, another UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is another 18th century building. This is the Khan's Palace. It's impressive from the outside, but even more impressive, the, the detail of the interior. Nearby, you'll also find an Armenian church in the old village of Kish. And again, this interweaving between the Armenians and the Azeris show that how much the two cultures used to be intertwined and how unfortunately now the two keep very much apart. Now, Sheki is only an hour, an hour and a half from the Georgian border. So I'm going to take you to the border. Um, First, I forgot you can buy some souvenirs and have some lovely um, Azeri food, which is a little bit of a mix between Turkish food and maybe Persian food and some great stuff there. Now, having eaten, I will take you to the border and hand you over to Johnny. Hi again, guys. Thank you very much, Mark. Hang on, let me get my slides up again. My slides, listen to me. Um, cool. So, Georgia. Uh, the Georgians have a saying. At the beginning of time, when God was giving out land to the various nations of the world, the Georgians were too busy drinking to attend. Arriving late, God was angry and asked why they had dishonored him so. There was now no land left to give them. But the Georgians replied that far from dishonoring God, they were late simply because they were drinking to his health, and this had taken quite some time. God was pleased with their answer and so gave them the tiny bit of land he'd been keeping for himself. Georgia is, as I hope to illustrate in the next 15 minutes or so, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. It's small, it's about the same size as Ireland, half the size of Georgia in the US, um, and it's about four and a half million people. But it, of course, has the, the, the great Caucasus and the smaller Caucasus running on both sides of a kind of valley running down the middle. And it, it's, it's a stunning country as I will show you. Um, uh, it's about four and a half hours flying time from London as well. So that's just a bit of uh, background. Now, as far as history is concerned, well, that dates back just about as far as you can go. The Georgians believe that the country was founded by Noah's great, great grandson, Kathros, and while Armenia next door was founded by his brother, Hike. Um, Jason and the Argonauts uh, came from Greece here, along with such legends as Hercules and Orpheus, uh, to claim the Golden Fleece from modern day Poti or in the old days Colchis. Uh, the Golden Fleece does have a certain amount of uh, truth to it, in, insofar as um, old gold panners back in the day used to use a fleece and let the water run over the fleece and collected the gold actually on the, on the wool, so it would become a golden fleece. So that does have some sense of reality. Um, in the fourth century, Georgia was the second country in the world in three, uh, 334 AD to convert to Christianity. That was under the King Miriam. Um, he was converted after being persuaded to by a Christian slave girl called Nina who came from Cappadocia. Um, and made Georgia, as I say, the second country in the world to become officially uh, Christian after Armenia. Um, following on from that, of course, you had the Silk Road. This ran from roughly 125 BC through to the time of Genghis Khan, if you like, and, and a little bit beyond, which is 13th, 14th centuries. Um, and goods would come, of course, all the way from China, through Central Asia, either across the Caspian Sea or around it via Iran and Azerbaijan um, and through Georgia. And there's a lot of history relating to the Silk Road in this country. Um, there is, of course, a massive link to the great Russian country to the north. And Georgia was officially annexed under Alexander I in uh, 1801, supposedly at the request of King George VII of Georgia. Um, this is a period um, that kind of starts the whole story of, of Russia's 
a dominance uh, Russia's dominance of Georgia. And a, one of my favorite books on the region is Mikhail Lermontov's Hero of Our Time. He was a young Russian officer that served in the Caucasus while they fought to take control of the unruly Caucasus tribes, uh, somewhat successfully, somewhat unsuccessfully. So if you want a good book on that region, that's what I would recommend. But the great thing about Georgia and this whole region as a whole, Armenia and Azerbaijan, is that it's really been um, sitting where it does at this crossroads of Asia, in the heart of Eurasia. It's had every conceivable kind of army of antiquity and beyond coming through there from the Arabs, the Turks, the Persians, the Mughals, Crusader Knights, Russian noblemen. Tbilisi, which I shall talk about in a second, has been sacked 27 times, nearly 28 in 2008, but the Russians held up a bit short of Tbilisi and didn't go into the city center. So all those people have left their mark. All those cultures uh, in the food, in the architecture, uh, have all left their mark, which is what makes this region, in my opinion, so special. So Tbilisi, let me talk about that. Um, as you can see here, it sits on the river there, which you can just see going down the uh, kind of right of the picture with the modern architecture. Uh, down there, uh, crossing the river, the bridge, etc. The name Tbilisi comes from Tibil, which means warm water. And there are, the, 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 the town was founded really because of its sulfur baths, its springs and, and the healing properties that they have. Um, and you can still go in there today and indeed enjoy them. Um, but what it also has, it's, it's, it's like a, a lot of these places, it's an it's a absolute mishmash of the cultures that I've been talking about. So although of course you will find many churches, you will also find mosques, synagogues, etc. Fitzroy Maclean traveled here, the famous English diplomat turned writer turned Ayrshire sheep farmer, um, wrote a wonderful book called Eastern Approaches um, about the 1930s in this region when he was a correspondent in Moscow. And um, he talks about coming to Tbilisi and, and finding jutting verandas hanging like swallows nest from the hillside homes, which is a very apt description of the old town. Of course, you've seen photographs already, I won't show them again, of the modern architecture, but Tbilisi is, is, a, is, a, is a place prim primarily a very, very old city, and that's the kind of sense you get. David the Builder is probably their biggest national hero. Um, I'm sure he'd have rather been called David the Great, but anyway, he was renowned for, uh, um, for, for driving out the Turks in the uh, 12th century, uh, sorry, yeah, 11th and 12th century, um, and building a lot of the great churches and monasteries that you can see today, some of which are World Heritage sites. Um, there's a fabulous museum in Tbilisi uh, with some wonderful gold ornaments that came from the from Colchis, the ancient capital there. Um, but it's also a very modern town now. As I say, when, when I was there in 1999, you saw the pictures. It was destitute, derelict, cold, just just pretty much bankrupt. It is anything but that now. It's vibrant. It's got a great young culture. It's got wonderful bars, restaurants. It, it's a really fun, fun place um, to, to, to hang out for a bit. Um, there are some, there's the Opera House, the famous Opera House. Um, interestingly, Georgia is, I think, the only country that I know of that has a centenarian choir. Um, so Georgia is renowned for longevity. People, not just Georgia, the Caucasus in general, both North and South Caucasus. People tend to live here up in the mountains for a very long time. So if you have a centenarian choir, that's pretty impressive. And of course, there are many great hotels, probably the most famous, um, and this is a big change in the 20 odd years, as I've already said, where it was only the Sheraton. Now you've got the Courtyard Marriott. If that's what you like, very smart. You've also got any number of um, boutique hotels that you can stay at in Tbilisi. So a great place to start your trip. Most trips will start there. From here, we go about 30 miles to the west and we head up to a place called Maxveta. Now that is the kind of spiritual home of the country, mainly because of the fact that this is where Christianity kind of arose in the country. So it's named after Kathlos' son, in other words, Noah's great, great, 
great-grandfather, inhabited for over 3,000 years. It's at the confluence of the Makvari and the Agvari rivers. As I say, it's, it's, um, it's Georgia's spiritual home. Legend has it that part of the crucifix, crucifixion robe was brought here where a queen clutched it so tightly she died and had to be buried with it. And from the burial place sprouted a cedar tree out of which the first church was built. Um, so it has its religious connotations dating back to the fourth century. Um, also on the hill above the town from where I took this photograph um, is the beautiful church of Javari. And on our trips, because you're generally or often arriving into Tbilisi on a Saturday, we tend to go up here on a Sunday morning, and therefore you can go inside and see a Georgian service going on. Now, the Georgian Earth Orthodox Christian services are not like they are in Britain or America, where they last for an hour and you, can, you know, it's all very structured. Here, it's a kind of free-for-all. People just come in, they go, they come in, they go, and it goes on for about six hours. And the Gregorian chanting happens and the various prayers happen and the wafting of the incense. And it's fascinating to go in and, and, and enjoy it. And um, that nobody minds, you just go in and, and, and enjoy the Georgians at prayer. From here, we head on up what's known as the, jo the Russian military highway, which links Georgia directly into South Ossetia and Vladikavkaz. Um, we follow up here classic scene, you're bound to pass the shepherds on the road taking their flocks higher up into the mountains. First place you'll pass is called Ananuri. This is a, uh, a 13th century fortress church. Um, the lake you can see in front hasn't always been there, interestingly. It was a reservoir uh, built uh, in the last century. And it's an excellent place if you're going there in midsummer to stop off and have a bit of a swim and see local Georgians enjoying themselves. But from here we come to one of the highlights of Georgia, which is Kazbegi, or the new name, uh, Stefans Minda, which is a, a little village, kind of it's about the last town slash village that you'll come to before the Russian border. And it's really famous for this amazing church on top of the hill, the uh, Gregory Church. We'll walk up there uh, to see it. Obviously, this photograph was taken with a drone, um, but we will go up there and it's a great place to go and have a picnic. Um, it's about a two hour hike, uh, walk around up the top here. You can see Mount Kazbegi behind there with the, sh with the snow on it. That's um, Europe's, I, I think I'm right in saying, uh, fifth highest mountain at just over 5,000 meters, 5,040 meters. Um, now, this was the first group that I ever took to Georgia. So I was good as my word. And when I set up Wild Frontiers in 2002, in 2004, just after the Rose Revolution, I took my first trip. Now, the chap you can see at the end there, notice any similarities? That's my dad and my mum sitting on his right. Um, and uh, we, we traveled out there and at the time, because I mean, there was no tourism at all. Um, and therefore we had to do homestays. And we stayed with a lovely lady called Nuna, who looked after us well. She chucked her daughter out of one room and her son out of another. And we all kind of hunkered down and stayed there just to show you how things have changed. So this is the new Rooms Hotel in uh, Kazbegi or Stefan's Minda, um, which is like, more like Soho House really. It's an incredibly beautiful place. It was when we were there, an old sanatorium, an old Soviet sanatorium, but it's been converted into this beautiful hotel. And those people sitting there on those comfortable chairs are looking directly at this view. So it's a pretty amazing turnaround. Um, and of course we can stay there. There's some great walking here. You can walk over a high pass from a village called Juta over the Abu Dulauri Pass, which is about 3000 meters into a valley on the other side called Rushka, uh, where you can do some whitewater rafting. Um, and, and you can do these kind of things really all over the northern, the, the northern part of the Georgian Caucasus. So from there, we come back down onto the main valley that, that as I say, runs from east to west through the center of Georgia, and we come to the town of Gori. Now, there's nothing hugely spectacular about Gori. They have their old fort, um, but it's really made more famous by this particular uh, man. Um, you may recognize him, you may not. He is original name. He was a bank robber turned communist henchman, and he was, his original name was Joseph Jushkafvili. Of course, you will know him as Uncle Joe. Joseph Stalin. He was born in 1878 in Gori, 
And um, the town, it's really their one claim to fame, I suppose. Um, I took this photograph with my, one of my first groups when Mr. Stalin was standing uh, very proudly right at the center of the town. Subsequently, like many of his statues and Lenin statues, he's been taken away from there. He does still have a statue in front of the, uh, the uh, Stalin Museum, which is a fascinating place to go around. Now, when I first went around there, there was a peroxide blonde, rather large babushka, old grandmother who absolutely extolled the virtues of Stalin. He could have done no wrong as far as she was concerned. These days, um, the new tour guides are slightly more um, open with the truth of the full story of Joseph Stalin. Uh, and it really is uh, an extraordinary and really well um, curated museum and well worth an hour. Outside the back is the famous, uh, his, his carriage, which he used to use to get around during the Second World War and beyond. He used this carriage to get down to Yalta to uh, meet with Churchill and uh, Roosevelt uh, in February 1945 to discuss the future of Europe. So um, quite an interesting bit of history there. Just outside uh, Gori is the cave town of Uplasteke, uh, which dates back all the way to the Iron Age. Um, uh, and just down the road from there, a little bit further, is the even more impressive cave town of Vardzia. This was uh, excavated between the 8th and 13th century, and just like Cappadocia in Turkey, was really used as a hideout and a defensive home uh, to protect persecuted Christians um, from the uh, invading Islamic Ottoman Turks. Um, it's an extraordinary place, 3,000 dwellings, some of which have 13 floors, um, literally stacked upon one another. From here, we're carrying now kind of round, so you're coming round to the, to the west of Georgia and starting to head north. We have the uh, Kertavezi uh, Fortress, which originally dates back to the second century AD. Uh, interestingly, it was sacked by the Mughals in the 13th century and the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Gelati Monastery. Um, now, I should have said uh, Maxveta and that whole area is uh, with the Javari Church as well. That is one UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is the second. And the third is the Sveneti Mountain region, which is right up, as I was saying earlier, sandwiched between the now Russian-dominated South Ossetia and Abkhazia. It's right in the middle of the two. So it's very remote. It has some of Europe's highest villages. Um, it has the classic Tolkien-esque um, defensive towers. It has stunning walks. And some of these walks now are part of what's known as the Transcaucasian Trail. This is a new trail of, of waymarked walks that have been, are still in the process of being set up right the way across the whole of the Caucasus. And on one of the tours that I'll show you in a minute, we do some of that Grand Caucasian, uh, Trans-Caucasian Trail. Um, other places that you will kind of come across are the, um, uh, uh, sorry, Akalteki, which is a fourth, uh, 10th to 4th century Ottoman fortress town, uh, the port city of Batomi, Katski, the amazing Katski uh, hermitage stuck on the top of that pillar, and Kertesi, which is the stepping off point for the Gelati Monastery. Also, importantly, for those of you watching this from Britain, it's where Wizz Air fly to from Luton. So that is an entry point that you can take advantage of should you wish. That's all over in the west. Heading to the east of Tbilisi, we have some other wonderful places. The David Garaji Monastery, um, Kaheti, the wine region, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second and Tusheti, which is one of my own personal favorite regions, which again has these wonderful defensive towers and some excellent hiking and horse riding. Um, so just quickly, Mark's been talking about the Across the Caucasus tour. As we say, that is our main tour that goes through all of these three countries. If you would rather specialize in Georgia itself, then our Myths and Mountains tour is our most popular. We run this nine times. It's only nine days. It's a great trip for a kind of entry level trip. We do get you off the beaten track, but we get you to the highlights as well. April, May, June, July, August, September, so pretty much throughout the summer. We have the Georgian Explorer, which is in-depth trip to Georgia, which covers pretty much everything, including Svaneti. So that runs three times a year, May, June, and September, 15 days. And we have a walking tour in Svaneti, which is 10 days, 
which you do obviously a lot more walking in that beautiful northern region. Now, before I close off and hand over back to Mark, there is one element of Georgia that you really need to think about, and that is the cuisine. It is probably the best in the region. One of my favorite cuisines. Um, again, very much a mixture. You can really see how it's a, the Silk Road has affected it. You've got Iranian dishes, you've got Chinese dishes. Top right, look at that. You've got momos, which are dumplings, which you would see in a dim sum um, from China. You've got the famous kachaburi cheese bread. Um, you've got all sorts of things made out of aubergines and walnut pastes and, um, of course, kebabs and also the breads. Look at the naans. They're very much from South Asia. So you have this wonderful collage of food that, that, that's come, that, that, that's been transported and changed across all those regions. And of course, you have a fantastic wine industry. Now, according to Hugh Johnson, the famous wine historian, uh, Georgia is the birthplace of wine with uh, wine dating, uh, with uh, evidence of viniculture dating back over 7,000 years. They have different, they have 3,000 different grape varieties. I couldn't possibly remember really any of them, but I have tasted some pretty excellent Georgian wine. I've tasted some pretty rubbish Georgian wine as well, to be perfectly honest. Um, but they have um, various uh, ways of making their wine. Of course, today it's moving into the modern world and Georgian wine, you can buy it in, in, in Waitrose or, 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 or wherever. Um, and this is a winery called Capsoretti, which uh, we take groups to. You can do a wine tasting here. It opened as Anne Boleyn was having a head lobbed off. 1536, it started its production. So it's been going a long time. It's now moved into the modern times, but a lot of the Georgian wine is still made in the traditional method, which is in uh, clay, huge clay uh, casts underground when just letting the grapes ferment. And we will see both and we will take you to the cellars where you'll be able to try both the wine and some of the uh, cha-cha, the spirit that they make, the distillation of the grape as well. And above all, you will meet Georgians and you will have plenty of delicious meals where you will be toasting to your heart's content. It is a fabulous country. Giving and hospitality is absolutely at the core of this nation. And uh, therefore, um, it makes for a pretty fantastic tourist destination. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark for the last part of this, which is Armenia. Okay. So, if I can find my slide, Armenia. So Armenia probably has more in common with Georgia than it does with Azerbaijan that I've said before, it does see a little bit of its arch enemy. Um, it's a historical, to be honest, the history of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, especially over this region of Nagorno-Karabakh, if I'm honest, I've probably read it six or seven times. I don't fully understand it, but if you're interested, it is quite fascinating, but it is still there and it is still a real tension. But Armenia sometimes defines itself in kind of opposition to Azerbaijan. So for example, whereas the language of Azerbaijan, Azeri, is Turkic in origin um, and is written in Roman script, um, for Armenian, it's an Indo-European, completely different language uh, with its own unique script. Additionally, whereas Azerbaijan is predominantly Muslim, Armenia absolutely is predominantly Christian. And as Johnny said, while Georgia may be the second oldest Christian country in the world, Armenia is the oldest Christian country in the world, dating its um, kind of adoption of Christianity to 301 AD, which means, like Georgia, you do get lots of churches. And especially if you're into pre-Romanesque architecture, you'll find many throughout the country. Well, what if you're not a big church fan? Eh, I can take a church, I'll leave it, whatever. It's worth remembering that the Armenians were also the ones that built the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. They are absolutely master architects. So I would say that Armenians are good for people that don't really do churches. You'll like the churches in Armenia. And additionally, like with Georgia, it's all about location, location, location. So just to give you a bit of an example, you'll find Khorvirap right there with Mount Ararat, which is actually over the border in Turkey um, as one of the iconic churches in the country. 
will find Norovank, which is on this promontory overlooking the Ganeshik River. You'll find Hagharsin, which is right in the middle of Dilijan National Park. And you'll have Tatev, which is right down in the south of the country, um, which is way up in the mountains and accessed via, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the longest reverse operated cable car in the world at over five kilometers. So it's just a selection of some of the churches that you can find there. But it's not just all about churches. Armenia, like Georgia, has got some absolutely breathtaking scenery. This is the Debed Canyon. You've also got a high altitude, huge lake up in the north of the country called Lake Savan at 1,900 meters. And then you've got just a variety of different things to see. This is a caravanserai uh, dating back to the old trading routes. This dates back to 1332. You've then got this place called Karahunj, which is often known as the Armenian Stonehenge. Those of you that know Britain will know, actually, it's more like Avebury than Stonehenge. Um, and they're not really sure exactly what it was used for. They think maybe for tracking the, um, the movement of the moon, but it's been dated back over 2000 years. And then nearby, you've got the tongue twisting cave city, not as extensive as Vardia, but this is Horndesk. Um, which you can lose yourself in um, just saying it rather than just exploring it. Um, and then you've got, again, just some weird sites. You've got this Greco-Roman temple of Garni dating back to 100 AD. And if people were wondering what this backdrop is behind me, this is the Cathedral of Zvartmots, which dates back to the 7th century, but interestingly was destroyed in an earthquake in 930 and not rediscovered until the 20th century. And as you can see there, you've got the backdrop of Ararat. One of the other things that you'll find as you travel through Armenia, and again, another world heritage um, acclaim, are these Kachgars. Now there's about 40,000 of them throughout the country. Kachgar actually means cross stone. And you've got these incredibly detailed rock car um, carvings. Um, that you'll find sometimes in the cemeteries and churches, sometimes you'll find them uh, carved into the sides of buildings, but they are wonderful um, and is something quite particular to Armenia. Now the capital, Yerevan, is quite different from Baku and from Tbilisi. It's much more, as I hope this kind of picture demonstrates, it's much more Soviet in feel. And Armenia today, probably has the strongest relationship with Russia than the other two Caucasus countries, um, but it's got some really fascinating things to see. One of my favorites, and it may not sound that interesting, but it's a book depository. It's called the Matanadaran, but it holds over 100,000 books. You may go, yeah, a book. Um, some of these are priceless manuscripts dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's one of the most incredible professional presentations that I've ever seen. And I guarantee will blow you away. You've also got some, um, I suppose not fun places, but it's incredibly important. There is a museum in Yerevan all about the Armenian genocide. Now it's impossible to go to Armenia and not talk about and understand the Armenian genocide that they claim to have suffered at the hands of the Turks during the First World War. Um, and this defines the relationship between Armenia and Turkey. And there's an incredibly, um, what's the word? There's an incredibly um, powerful museum there in the capital that you can visit. On a more lighthearted note at the weekends, you've got a flea market known as the Venissage, which is a great, great place to pick up carpets, pick up some souvenirs, and then there is the food. Now, I have to accept a Georgian food, Johnny is right, is probably the best in the region, but Armenian food comes a very, very, very close second. You'll find some absolute wonderful breads, some very, very thin lavash breads, which I love. You'll also find sujuk. Now you'll find this also in Georgia as well. Um, and it's this bizarre but wonderful thing where they take walnuts and they dip them in this kind of grape mixture and then they let it dry in the sun. And what you get left with, as you can see in the center of the picture here, are these basically these fruity, nutty things which are great for just snacky food, very nutritious um, and very tasty. 
um, Belmades, again, influences from all over the region. Now, there are some people that you may not meet um, in Armenia uh, that have Armenian heritage, um, but you will definitely meet Armenians old and young, um, and they are an incredibly pal, proud and very, very well-educated people, and they will show you an incredibly good welcome to their country. You can do traditional sightseeing in Armenia, but if you want a more active trip, like Georgia, it's also part of the Trans-Caucasian Trail, and there's some stunning walking, as well as some stunning horse riding as well, for those of you that like. It can be visited as part of the Across the Caucasus tour, tailor-made, but also new for this year. We've got a trip which focuses in just on Armenia um, because we really feel that this will be the next big place in the region to really take off in the same way that Georgia has. That's me for Armenia. Back over to you, Johnny. Thank you, Mark. Uh, right, let me go back to my slide, my pictures, yep. Okay, um, great. Well, that's kind of our whistle-stop tour through the course. I had no idea Cher was Armenian. There we are. Um, what I also wanted to say is because this, I, I'm taking a walking tour to Eastern Turkey on the 5th of September, and there's a second departure on the 14th of September. I was gonna say there are two places left on my tour, but they sold out late this afternoon. But there is plenty of availability on the 14th of September. So if you fancy going there, it's all COVID viable and it will be a great trip, I'm sure. I'm really looking forward to it. The reason why I wanted to kind of show this photograph is because of course you can see here, this is Arnie, which is on the, uh, on the Turkish side. But again, you can see on the right hand side, that is that river constitutes the border between Turkey and Armenia. So you're, you're that close and therefore you obviously have a lot of the same cultural similarities. You will also witness the extraordinary uh, fourth century monastery of uh, Sumela, which will be uh, pretty exciting. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I do get onto the website. We, if you do want to go on the 14th of September departure, you have to get your skates on because we need to get that sorted out pretty quickly. So do get in touch with us tomorrow. Um, we still have the 25 pound or 32 dollar uh, deposit offer for the whole of August. That will be running for another 10, 12 days. Um, and that is uh, available for both groups and tailor-made. So do take advantage of that. We're trying to make this in the time of COVID, along with our COVID promise, which guarantees refunds and transfers, etc. cetera, uh, should trips not be able to go ahead, which we think is probably among the most generous in the industry. So do jump on and book your trips for 2021, 2022. We've got many trips up for 2022 as well. So do get onto the website and have a look. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we run groups and tailor-made. So we have a maximum group size of 12. We have tour leaders and local guides accompanying the trips. We have interesting and comfortable accommodation and transport, full board. So almost all meals are included and we have a uh, COVID health and safety policy in line with the World Tourism Council. Um, and Taylor made a full team of expert specialists both in the UK and US and expert knowledge of those areas. And we are of course at all protected. Um, so we're now gonna do uh, a Q and A. We've got a few minutes left. So uh, Mike, you're in charge. Uh, any questions come in? Thank you. Yes, and just a, a note that do use the Q&A button if you'd like to ask a question. There is still time if you just click on that and type a question. We've had a few coming in. Um, Julie and Nicola would like to know whether British passport holders need visas to visit Georgia, Armenia or Azerbaijan. Mark? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, go on. Yeah. So um, Armenia and Georgia are both visa free and Azerbaijan is an e-visa, um, which is very easy to get, but that needs to be arranged in advance, that's it. And I think it's the same for Americans as well. Obviously at the moment with COVID, there's a few things which have been put on hold, uh, but that's generally how it was up until everything was operating normally. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Simon, who's uh, traveled to Georgia before with Wild Frontiers, is wondering whether we're planning to run a trip just to Armenia and Azerbaijan for those like him who's all, who've already visited Georgia? Well, you can't do both countries together without going through Iran or without going through um, Georgia. 
as I said, they may share a border, but there is no open border. We do, as you saw, have a group tour, um, which is just in Armenia. We don't have a group tour, um, which is just in Azerbaijan. That would have to be done as, as a standalone um, tailor-made. And that's partly just because realistically, um, one, there's really only about four or five days worth of um, things which we really feel are, are worth doing for most people in Azerbaijan, unless you're an incredibly uh, big Azerbaijan fan and you can go up into the mountains. There's a little Jewish village up in the north. You can go down into the south to Lankaran, which is also on the Caspian Sea. But that does become quite bespoke interest, I would say. Mark, Mark, tour and tailor -made. Mark quite a nice idea, though. Baku into Iran and up into Armenia. We used to do that. We had our, well, we had our um, journey around the Caspian Sea yeah, trip, Caspian, which would yeah. go Turkmenistan, Iran, and then it would include, I think, kind of either one or both of those. Um, but it was, it was, I have to admit, it was a tough sell. It was a little bit too niche, even yeah. for our very well-traveled clients. Thank you, Mark. Um, Julie would like to know whether English is widely spoken in these countries. Uh, yes, it is, uh, particularly as with a lot of these places with the young. Um, if you're, when you're up in the, in the high Caucasus and going into little villages, obviously a lot of the older generation won't. They will speak um, Georgian, but they will also speak Russian. By the way, I should just say, uh, Mark talked about the script of Armenia being one of the unique scripts of the world. Georgia has a unique script as well. So there are 13 unique scripts in the world and Georgia and Armenia have two of them. Um, but yes, the answer is certainly places like Tbilisi, Yerevan, Baku, very cosmopolitan. Of course, the, the younger people there since the kind of yoke of the Soviet era has been lifted are all looking towards the West for their cultural uh, interests. And so uh, uh, speak English very widely. Absolutely. Great. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the altitude as well, from one from Val and one from Usha. Uh, how high are the cities in Georgia and, and does the altitude present a problem? Is there any acclimatisation needed? No, absolutely not. No, the highest places you're going to, uh, even if you're going on walking tours, uh, crossing passes, uh, is, is about, the highest you'll ever get to is about just over 3,000 metres. The towns and villages are much lower than that, so there shouldn't be any issue at all, unless of course you're going to try and climb Mount Kazbegi uh, or something like that. But even that is only 5,000 meters, so you would obviously need to do it slowly, but, but you know, it, it, it's not like uh, traveling in the Himalayas. Great. Um, this might be one for you, Mark, testing your logistical skills, but um, William would like to know whether it's possible or even sensible to get to Georgia by train. Ooh. Um... I was actually asked that question recently and the answer is yes, it is possible. Um, it's quite long and quite expensive and I can't remember, I'd, I'd be absolutely um, trying to bluff my way through it, but yes, from London, it is possible to get all the way to Georgia by train. Yeah, Mark, you, I mean, I've done a large part- Istanbul, And then you can come from Istanbul through and they have now um, created rail links that go all the way through to Azerbaijan, I believe. Yeah, no, I, I've done a large part of that rail link and you can certainly get, basically you're gonna go through Venice down through uh, Croatia and, and, and uh, the Balkans down into Istanbul and then you can go all the way across the country uh, by train as well. It, it does take a long time and the Turkish train across there is not the quickest. So I remember, I mean, I'm talking some time ago, but I actually took a coach across, but, uh, but yeah, you can definitely do that. Great. Um, Audrey would like to know what we think the chances of the October trip running to the, um, the across the Caucasus, October, 2020. I hate it when we get asked this question on these so difficult. webinars. Um, <laughs> I mean, Georgia is the one place where, uh, the COVID levels in the Caucasus are not that great. Um, and therefore, you know, we're still holding out some hope that that region will become COVID viable. But of course, we have to rely on the British government as much as we have to rely on the Armenians, the Azeris and the Georgians. Um, so it's difficult to say, but um, yeah, I, I, we're still hoping, hoping for the best. Great. Um, what about the dress code, particularly for women? Is there, should you dress conservatively in these three countries? Mark, do you want to uh, Only, um, not 
um, I wouldn't say, no, you don't, shouldn't, you shouldn't dress conservatively. There's no need to dress conservatively. They're generally quite cosmopolitan places. Um, but all I would say is when you go into some of the churches, especially in Georgia, um, women will need to cover their heads. So it's worth taking a headscarf with you. And again, maybe in some of the smaller villages in Azerbaijan, going to La Huj, or even some of the smaller, more traditional villages in Georgia and, and uh, Armenia. And they're not conservative, I would just say they're traditional. But as a general rule, you can wear whatever you like. Um, and I think that is changing and getting more and more um, modern every year. Great. Um, and Doug would like to know whether there's anything in place kind of like with the Israel in the Middle East thing where if you visited um, Armenia and you have a stamp in your passport, does that cause you problems visiting Turkey? No, um, they're not ecstatic about it. Um, oh, Armenia and Turkey, no problem. That, that's just, I mean, that they know that there is some tension between the two countries, but not a problem at all. With Armenia and Azerbaijan, no problem just to have an Armenian visa or an Azerbaijan visa. But if you do want to visit Nagorno-Karabakh, which as I said, can only be accessed through Armenia with a permit, you're absolutely recommended not to do that before then going into Azerbaijan. They will probably let you in, but they won't be happy about it. So generally when we have people asking to visit Nagorno-Karabakh, we usually recommend that they do it after their visit. So Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, and then you visit Nagorno-Karabakh and then you come back to Armenia um, and you fly out of there. That's definitely the way to do it. Thank you, Mark. Uh Ali would like to know when is the best time of year to visit the region? Really throughout the summer months. So from um, kind of beginning of April, right the way through to the end of October. Um, you know, it, it obviously does get hot there in the height of summer. So um, depending on how much you like or dislike extreme heat, by which I mean, you know, Tbilisi can get up to the top high 30s, even touch 40. So if that's too hot for you in July, then go for one of the kind of April, May, September, October. That's probably the ideal time to visit, um, but it's perfectly possible to visit the, the, the whole of the kind of summer period. Great, thanks, Johnny. This is possibly one for you, Mark. Anne is just wondering whether US citizens are available, uh, um, it's possible to visit these places for US citizens, any restrictions or visas needed? At the moment, Yes, there are restrictions. Um, we, this is our daily, this is, this is the daily fund that we have looking at the UK and the US websites and seeing what countries are viable and what they're not. At the moment, um, Azerbaijan and Georgia are not actually welcoming tourists at the moment. Um, as Johnny was saying, they haven't had uh, particularly bad COVID spikes, so they're just trying to protect themselves. Um, and that could change at any moment. Um, and in the past, there were absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. So I'm sure as soon as they open up and start welcoming people, that the UK and the US will be involved in that, assuming that UK and US COVID figures don't get worse than they currently are. Great. Um, and Lynn is from the US. She's keen to book for September 2021. She's just wondering would she be able to cancel without penalty if she needed to? Mark, Do you want to talk about that, the COVID promise? Uh, go on, Mark, sorry. Okay, all right, I'll do it. So basically at the moment, we're aware that we're asking people or we're encouraging people to book on a trip, which isn't currently possible. So really to give people reassurance, we're giving them really kind of three levels of protection. One, we're saying if you want, you can secure your place with from the US, $32, that's it. Secondly, if at any time you want to transfer to another trip, you can transfer free of charge, no problem, transfer around, realistically as many times as you want. We're just saying, you know, kind of just whenever you want to, you can move around. At the point at which the trip becomes viable, which means we've checked it out from our own risk assessment and it means that the British government, we are here in London, um, are saying it's okay to travel and the Georgians are accepting us. We will then write to everyone that's booked to go, great, good news, we can now run your trip. What would you like to do? 
If people want to stay on the trip, brilliant, just pay the rest of the deposit, you're good to go and you're secured. If you don't, no problem, you can transfer to another trip. If in the worst case scenario, we get to a point where we are near to departure, as there was a gentleman asking about the October trip, we review trips on a regular basis, but if we get to within 45, 30 days of departure and it's not viable, we'll obviously give you the option of a full refund of whatever monies you paid. But realistically at the moment, you're looking at a maximum of $32 until it gets to the point where it is viable. Thank you, Mark. That's a way of saying yes. <laughs> um, that's great. And Carolyn would like to know whether there are any age restrictions for members on our group trips. No. Um, we have taken people um, well into their mid-80s. If people are of certain ages and depending on the nature of the trip, we may send them some questionnaires to get some additional thing and may even have a chat with them just to make sure that it is the right type of trip for them um, because it's not fair on, on them or on the other members of the group. Um, if basically it's a misfit. But the one thing that we're very aware of is that age itself is no barrier to travel. Um, and you know, we've, had said, we've taken many, many, many fit people in their 70s and 80s traveling as well. Um, and we've also had people in their 40s who actually struggle with trips as well. So no, we just wanna try and make sure it's a good match, the trip and the person. Great, thank you, Mark. Well, I think that's all we have time for for the questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get time to answer your particular question, but I'll do a summary in the email tomorrow and try and answer a few of the outstanding questions in that. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't visited this amazing region, we really hope you'll join us next year or even in 2022. Um, look out for an email for our next talk. It's to be confirmed, but we will be hosting more of these webinars in September. So we'll keep in touch and um, keep safe and healthy, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye.